the PD needs survey that Ms. Green sent out. And the two things that I'm attacking on that list are some student engagement tools. And then a lot of you asked, what are other people doing? So this was my kind of way to be voyeuristic, if you will. And um, just take a peek in other classrooms to see what's working and how teachers are engaging students. So let's just take a minute to get started and consider the following questions. What is your favorite part of a lesson or and or what has been your favorite lesson so far this year? Also have this picture um, in the corner. You can think of ponder that if uh, if you're waiting on everyone else. That's going to kind of be the theme of our discussion today. I'm going to set my timer for two minutes and then we will share up. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. So um, those of you that were just joining us, we were considering these uh, questions about student engagement or lesson design. What is your favorite part of a lesson or what has been your favorite lesson so far this year? So we are going to take a minute to introduce ourselves, what you teach, and um, share your I'm thoughts. Happy. Ms. Douglas, you, you, you are. Douglas, you're Ms. Douglas, you're you so you get to go first. I'm <laughs> 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 like talking to me. Uh, That's funny. <laughs> um, <sighs> Okay, I wasn't exactly ready. Um, I I like doing. I, I know in the previous um, session we're in, some people were saying that maybe Neopods are getting old, but I think I like the part where they participate and have to answer on the screen, and even if it's not a long answer, like a, they call it a collaborative board, that works well for me. Great, thanks. And Ms. Douglas um, teaches eighth and ninth grade, right? And I'm sorry. No, 12th grade. Oh, I'm sorry. I okay. forgot that. Okay. Um, I'm going to go in the order that I see you on my screen. Oh, so, okay. this is your next. <laughs> Ms. Pace, can you share your thoughts next? Okay, well, I, I had to unmute. I'm sorry. My favorite um, part of lesson, I mean, teaching, and oh, wait, let me back up a second. I teach eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade math. My favorite um, part of teaching is actually teaching the meat of the lesson to the kids and then just, you know, watching them actually light up whenever they learn something. Um, and one of the things that I had the toughest time with probably this year was getting them actually involved in the lesson. And when I incorporated the Nearpod, 
you know, they, you know that they're actually working and during your lesson when they are at a distance from you. So that was something that I definitely like to include. I do, and now I know that, they, I mean, I've heard also that the kids are saying that, you know, it's getting old, but it is a way of us definitely um, seeing that they're working in class. Mm -hmm. That's it. Great, thank you. Ms. Dombrowski? Um, so my favorite, I guess, student, I have two things. Um, the favorite, my favorite thing that my students have done is a flip grid where they um, used rhetoric to argue a point. Um, I guess I liked it because I got to know them a little bit and see them and hear them. And my favorite part of any lesson is when we are reading something and discussing something and the kids are actually <laughs> discussing the text as opposed to me telling them what it is. So I think the most um, recent example of that is uh, some poetry that we did a couple weeks ago. Awesome, thank you. Ms. Lesh? Hi, I'm Emily Lesh, I teach eighth grade math. Um, my favorite part of the lesson is the um, guided practice where students are working with each other to discuss math problems while I'm walking around and listening to what they're discussing, which is always interesting how they come about some of these answers. Um, and the favorite lesson I did this year um, was be the teacher. So students volunteered to lead the class for that day. Um, and they enjoyed um, being the teacher and they got to see, you know, a little bit of the stressful side of things, um, but it helped them with their motivation and engagement in class from there on out so they could see the interaction from the teacher's point of view. Great, thank you so much. And then my first session, I had the stress, the technology stress. So we're gonna uh, do things a little bit different today because of that. So that's that's teaching, make it work, right? Ms. Eustace? Um, I teach mostly seniors, some juniors. Um, I teach the UNO dual enrollment, college algebra, and the advanced math and statistics. Um, the, one of the favorite lessons that I found, a lot of students have trouble reading graphs. Reading from the x-axis and the y-axis gets really complicated. So I did this system where they had to build a rectangle around the figure and read the parameters on the x-axis and the y-axis and learn how to read from the bottom to the top and the left to the right. And it really helped them succeed. When I gave the test, the scores were much higher than I expected. So you can't do this with um, graphs that have arrows. So then we progressed to the ones with arrows and then they're able to do it because they've got the concept down. So it was really successful. Awesome, thank you for sharing. Mr. Shrank? Hi, uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm Todd Shrank. I teach middle school theater. And uh, my, my favorite parts of lessons cannot be done this year, but as far as this year goes and what we're doing this year, I'm gonna have to agree with Ms. Dombrowski. My favorite parts of lessons is when uh, the subject matter uh, sparks at what what comes closest to actual conversation. So we're having a conversation about the content rather than my telling students about content and students replying uh, with a word or two. Um, and that's happened a couple of times, both with the work that we've done this year with uh, text on Romeo and Juliet, as well as uh, A Raisin in the Sun. Um, both are uh, have a lot of significant themes that the students are able to relate to uh, their own lives and make connections between things that they experience and things that uh, people in the past may also have experienced. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Bodier. You're on mute, Ms. Bodier. Um, I was very excited earlier this year because I tend to put up note pages for the students and then I like to write on the note pages and then I give them um, worksheets also and we now have a, a tool that we can use called 
uh, to draw board PDF. And so I can take my worksheets, put them up on the screen, and I can write on them. So I can write on my blank worksheet when I'm giving my lectures. And then when the students are having problems with their homework questions, they can, you know, present their screen to me or I can pull up my, um, you know, it's like so much easier than me using Cami to show them on the screen because it actually lets me pull up my worksheet and write on it as if it was a piece of paper. And so I tend to be old school. I want a blackboard and a piece of chalk. So <laughs> um, that was a huge uh, discovery for me. Great, thank you. Mr. Lopez? Oh, I don't know. Um, the only thing that came to my, my brain was, as a student or as a teacher, my favorite part of the lesson is when they say, y'all have a good afternoon, and they dismiss you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That was stuck in my head. Um, but my favorite lesson this year was when I actually got to do a lab uh, with the kids that were in class and stuff. And unfortunately, the kids online just had to watch it being done, kind of. And, they did have an actual um, virtual part that they could follow, but um, much better to actually do them in person. Yeah, Mr. Wheeler, Coach Wheeler. Um, I teach um, I teach fifth grade uh, health and PE. Right now, I'm just teaching PE. Um, my favorite part of the lesson would probably be uh, with PE or te I'm te I'm teaching kids in front of me and online at the same time. So I kind of have to set my laptop up in a way where the kids online are following along with stretching. Also with the students in front of me that are stretching at the beginning of class. Uh, so asking students that are actually with me to kind of take the lead and get in front of the camera and uh, lead stretching. Um, I like that. Not, they don't always want to do that though. They, they shy away from getting in front of the computer. So when actually have a student step up and lead the stretches is uh, definitely one of my favorite parts because then uh, I don't have to do it uh, and, they can, and they can do it. Um, one of my favorite lessons uh, this year for me was an assignment that um, I gave the students and they had to research and present um, an app that they could find on their phone or use on their phone or their tablet um, that can increase their physical fitness level. Um, since especially for my fully online students, you know, not being at school, uh, then taking accountability and ownership of talk about in class, but um, it's actually a more pleasant experience than it sounds like they um, because it was cathartic. So I made myself vulnerable. I did it too. And then they um, shared theirs after I had done mine. And um, part of it, part of the point was it was to work through 
some of the anxiety or guilt or shame of having a label put on you by other people at a previous time. So that went really well. Fade. I'm not sure what the problem is. Hopefully y'all can still see me. Uh, Coach Barris. So just what what's the favorite part of what's going on right now? Favorite Sorry, part of a lesson, part. your favorite lesson so far. Uh, so I teach first responder and health. Um, I'm just like Mr. Dr. Nye just said, you know, I think we all got into this because of that interaction day in and day out, getting to know them. Um, this year, now that I've gotten them back the past couple of weeks, got them in class, I think that just seeing them be excited about doing something, you know, again, we've been doing CPR the last couple of weeks, so they actually moving around. Um, kids at home, you could see that they're kind of wish that they were there. And I actually just talked to my kids the other day and like six of them that weren't supposed to come back are coming back next week. And then after the holidays, you know, seeing, they see it at home, what we're doing at home. I mean, at school and they want to come back. They want to be a part of it. And that, that gets me uh, re-energized to get them here and, and get in our programs, you know, full fledged, not just sitting at home. So that's what I'm excited about. Great, thank you. Mr. Landry? The question was, what was our favorite lesson? Is that is that what the question was? I'm sorry. Favorite part of a lesson, any lesson, or a, a, your favorite lesson so far this year? Um, my favorite thing to do is labs. I teach biology and biomed, so I can't wait to um, get into the lab room downstairs and, and work with the simulation models, but um, it's kind of challenging to do labs right now. So the, the most recent thing that I did was a homeostasis lab and the kids are able to do at home. They have to do um, some exercises and take data, um, quantitative, uh, how much they sweat, their temperature, heartbeat, heart um, and breathing rate. And then I also have them graph that information um, so that because they don't know how to graph right now, like Ms. Um, Eustis said. So hopefully this group of kids that I teach will know how to graph when they get to you. But, um, and then they also had to do a flip grid to discuss the data. So I'm trying to encourage them to um, talk about science and data and feel comfortable um, doing that. So I'll try to encompass all those different things in one assignment. That's Great, thank you. Ms. Belina? Ms. Spine, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was having issues. Um, yes, I, I agree with everyone else. The most, the, the favorite part of my lessons is getting, getting the students engaged. So after I give some direct instruction, watching them work with it and giving them feedback on that. And my favorite part of that is, you know, when they, we do the near puzzle thing and they, my favorite part when they start asking, can you check my Ms. Bolina? Can you check my, did I do it right? Did I do it right? So that in, interaction is, is fun. Um, my favorite part used to be when I can do um, stations or scavenger hunts around the room and things like that, which I can't really do as much this year, but I have done it on Google Slides, which was kind of cool. It worked out a little bit. And I also someone mentioned the Flipgrid too. One of my favorite things this year that I hadn't done in the past at the beginning of the year was a Flipgrid getting to know you kind of thing. And that was super helpful, especially this year when you don't get to interact as much. They, I got a little snippet of their life um, at the beginning, so that was fun this year too with the Flipgrid. Awesome, thank you. Ms. Joyner. Hi, I'm Ms. Joyner and I teach ninth grade Algebra 1. My favorite part of all the lessons are whenever the students have to try to work out the problems while I'm still there on the call with them. Um, I like it when I give them time to work out the problem and they'll say, oh, I think this is the answer. And it gives me a chance to like look at their work. I'll tell them, hold it up to the screen sometimes. Or if it's in the Nearpod, show me and, or what well, they're showing me in the Nearpod. But um, it's a chance for me to tell them, OK, wait, you did really great here, but you made a mistake there because it helps them to know where they're making a mistake at. Or if they did learn the concept well enough to say, OK, I got it and I'm ready to try it out without you. So that's my favorite part. 
Awesome, thank you for sharing. And then Ms. Pilcher. Yeah, so I'm teaching um, 10th, 11th, and 12th ELA classes. Um, I think my favorite part of any lesson is um, if I can have like an aha moment with them. Sometimes it's when we're reading and there's like a twist or sometimes it's when things just become clear to them. And my favorite lesson this year was um, when we were studying rhetoric and they were kind of struggling with ethos, pathos, and logos. And um, we put it into practice by watching some TV commercials and they seemed to really like it. And it, I think it helped um, kind of build their understanding. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Ms. Gutierrez, I think she is going in and out as well. I'm not sure, are you there Ms. Gutierrez? No, okay. Um, so if I don't share anything else, point now that can help you. All of you just shared amazing ideas and the rest of my presentation may not be what you're expecting as far as looking at a lesson plan template or specific um, you know, logistical things, but it's more about kind of the theory of lesson design. And um, there was a picture on that slide. I did try to put the slideshow link into the chat box. Um, I know a few of you kind of joined a minute or two after I did that, but I, again, I'm kind of lagging. So if someone can re copy and paste that for me, that would be amazing because it's not letting me on my end. Um, but if you want to open that and follow along, I think I made a very creative slideshow um, because all of the pictures that you see throughout the slideshow, if you do get on there, are linked to video clips from people's classroom or resources that they've used in their classroom. So um, we are lucky enough to have most of those people here on this call. So you'll get it live in person from them. And then if you have time, I really recommend you going back to look at all of those uh, videos to see what you like, what you notice, what they can improve on. Um, you know, it's not about critiquing them, but just kind of being self-reflective in your own practice by seeing what other people are doing, which is what uh, many of the requests were in the PD survey. And the video captures it so much better than I can explain it, but um, I surely will try, and I apologize for the technology issues. So on slide two on that welcome screen, I also had uh, that Disney picture. Does anybody have any ideas why I included that Disney picture or what that might represent? You can unmute if you have any thoughts. That's the ticket to join the rod. To join the class. Okay. Anybody else? No. Have you seen it yet? Y'all still trying to get in? So that's um, if you've ever heard of Disney Magic, if you just Google Disney Magic, you'll see the word touch point. And so part of Disney's uh, plan or part of, you know, their whole Disney Magic or how many times can they engage with the customer? So Thinking about that, that's kind of what we're talking about through this session today. I do want this to be more collaborative and I'll show you how we do that in a minute. But really thinking about how many times we can make those connections with students to make all of those things happen that you mentioned. So Ms. Eustace talked about using scaffolding up to um, more rigorous problems. Um, Ms. Um, Dombrowski talked about using Flipgrid so it was in a different environment so that they're more comfortable with the content. But all of those are touch points. So we will look at different um, classroom settings and different content areas. I did think this was geared towards high school, so I apologize. I don't have middle school exemplars, but I would love for you to share them with me so I can add them. But each person's picture is linked to a resource, whether it's a screencastify of their class or something. Um, so again, I encourage you to go look at that uh, after. So there's your touch point. The lady in the background with the yellow shirt is a cast member. She works at Disney. She has that device in her hand. So she's collecting data. And that's what the teacher needs to do, collecting data to see what does the student know? What do you need to, what is the pulse? What is What are the students getting? And a lot of the feedback surveys, it was, the word invisible kept coming up. The students are invisible or they feel invisible or they think they're invisible. 
And so as admin, we're helping to establish some of these policies that we talked about in our grade level meetings this morning about requiring cameras on and, and hosting um, different detention sessions so that you have a little bit more, um, uh, I don't want to say authority, but you have those consequences in place because some of you have expressed that you are feeling like you would tell them to do things, but they really, you really didn't know what to do beyond just telling them. So hopefully you feel supported in that way. And then obviously the technology. So in the first session, somebody said, I don't know what Disney didn't look like that when I went in high school a long time ago. So same thing in education. It may not look the same as it did even last year, much less when we were in school. So things are evolving, things are changing. The way that students are engaged is changing. So again, I'm not gonna have the magic bullet here to tell you everything that works, but if we can go back to important touch points that we can have with the kids and have these reflective conversations, then when we're building our lessons, because we have a template and we, we know our content, then we can be a little bit more in tune with what our students' needs, wants are, and then um, build more engaging lessons. So I ask that you participate um, with me. Uh, I'm going to copy these five questions from slide three and try to put them into the chat box. But all of you have the link to the, um, to the slideshow. If you, um, I'm going to put you guys, we're all friends now, and so there's no strangers. I'm going to put you into a breakout room for about five minutes, and I would like for you to discuss each of these five questions because the answers to these questions will be used throughout the rest of the presentation. So um, as soon as I put you in the breakout room, I'll be coming around to join you and hear your conversations, and then in five minutes, it'll bring you back to the main room. Does anybody have any questions before we begin? Okay. I'm opening the rooms. You guys should be getting a request to join the breakout rooms. No? Mine just says breakout rooms are in session, but I didn't get anything that invited me. Fantastic. Let me try again. Now it's counting down. Well, you can be thinking about the answers to those questions while you're getting placed. It's still, um, I'm having an issue because it still has my people from the last call on showing. Has anybody had that issue? Let me try and clear. Okay. We'll try again. Try one more time. If not, we'll try a different plan. I did the same thing again. It just says that they're in session. Okay. I mean, I don't mind doing the round robin kind of like we just did, though, with some of those questions. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just, I was just trying to figure out why it was still showing people from last time because I had got out and back in. So here we go. This is real life, right? Mm. So my first question um, 
My first question was, uh, Chase, it always does that. I don't know why it's still showing the old people. That's weird. It does. Michelle Molina in our, in our last session said that if somebody beats you in, then you lose the rights to actually do stuff. So it does some tricky things sometimes. Oh, okay. Interesting. Well, see, I learned something new every day. Uh, so my first question were, was how do students seek connections with you? And so I'm going to um, even, okay, use a different meet next time. Thank you. Um, well, I'm just going to go through the questions as we get to them, because these are the questions that are facilitating our discussions. So, um, sorry, one second, I'm going to close this. <laughs> All right, so um, I am on slide four. The first question was, how do students seek connections with you? And this is in connection with teacher empathy. Um, so I do have my takeaways there and things I wanted to contribute, but can you guys share out how do, you, how do students seek connections with you? Some of you mentioned it in our first kind of introduction and warm up, but I'd love to hear from you. Mr. Shank, do you have your hand up? Yeah, um, I, I guess just it's the phrasing of the question that's causing me to consider this situation a little bit differently, but I feel like sometimes students seek connection with me by trying to destroy what I'm trying to create in the classroom. <laughs> okay, so a negative connection. Well, it feels that way to me. Yeah. But maybe I'm not responding to it properly. Okay. That's, thank you for being self-reflective. Um, let's try and think about this in a positive way. How could you seek connections or how could students seek connections with you? How do you present yourself or what types of things do you intentionally do for them to be able to connect with you? I didn't, I didn't mean that to be negative. Oh, no. Um, just recognizing that a student who's doing something that aggravates me might be seeking a uh, connection rather than sure. trying to create a negative situation. Sure, and, I, and not everything's going to work, and not every student's going to respond in the same way. So I didn't think that you were intentionally, you know, being negative, but um, just what opportunities can we present for students to see connections with you in case they want to, or even if they don't want to? Ms. Uh, Bodier? Um, I... At the beginning of every Google Meet that I go to and with my kids when they come in, I always welcome them to class, you know, and say, you know, how's your day going? Hope everything's going well, you know, and then at the end of class, you know, I always, you know, tell them to have a nice day. I always invite them to come to my uh, Google Meets for extra help at 1120. Um, and you know, I'm always telling them, guys, if you have a question, I'm here. I, you know, I want to help you. Um, try to meet up with me so we can see what we can do to help you if you're not doing well. So I always try to invite them to join in. Great. Thank you. Ms. Lesh? Um, I did the same thing with greeting them. I also um, encourage them to come to office hours or an independent study and sometimes even they just come just to talk about their day. Um, but what I've been doing lately is we share music. So at the end of the class period, we'll, um, they'll give me a song that they would like me to go listen to. And then I give them a song that I want them to go listen to. And let me just say our taste in music is very different sometimes. But then we come back the next, the next class and we talk about, hey, did you like it? Did you not like it? That kind of thing. And that's been keeping it like they want to come back to know. So I find that it's increasing our connections. Awesome. Thank you so much. Ms. Belina. Um, I just this is just a small thing, but I always make it a point to thank them when they have a question. Thank you for that for that question. I appreciate it. And also making sure that they understand that it doesn't matter if I just explain them. Please um, ask me again. So it gives me another opportunity to explain it in a different way. Just so they know that questions are welcome and it's a safe place for them. Awesome. Thank you. And then teaching them how to ask a question instead of just, um, I don't know if Ms. Joyner, you want to share, but she had some students um, that she was working through. I think she did a great job 
addressing students who are just like, I don't get it. And she's like, what do you mean you don't get it? Like, I, that's not fair. Like, let's use our words. Let's tell me what part do you understand this part? You know, so she walked them through giving them that um, expectation. She set that expectation for them and then stuck with it. Let the kid know they weren't going to get off the hook that easy. So I, I, it was a great opportunity for me to see. Um, Ms. Pilcher, you had something? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I think, you know, I think most of us would agree that this is a kind of a cumbersome school year and not what we had all hoped for. But um, one thing that I've seen as like a silver lining is something that in my teaching experience I've never had, which is so much time with such a small amount of students in like their asynchronous time and recess and lunch and things like that, where I can kind of help them with anything and just get to know them. And so I think even though it doesn't necessarily span across everyone I teach, um, I've built up really good connections with the people that I get to see and people who come to office hours. And I feel like probably most of our students feel like they've had a connection with at least one teacher that they've spent that time with, which I think is positive. Great, thank you. Mr. Landry? Um, mine's kind of the same thing. I definitely have gotten closer to my um, first hour, which is my async group. Um, so I'm able to see, you know, ask them about their other class. And else I do, uh, some of the other teachers know during recess, I go out there and play with them. Um, volleyball is really the only sport out there that I'm capable of doing. Um, I have soccer too, but um, it gets a little competitive and I don't like to lose just because they're through it. But um, and that kind of helps with the classroom too, because they'll say, oh, you know, you hit me in the head with the volleyball, can I get some bonus points? I'm like, no, maybe actually. But, um, you know, so they bring up, you know, oh, next class, next recess, you know, we're going to win, you know, so it helps, you know, them get to know me as a person and not just as a teacher, because I get to be myself out there, you know. So, Great. Yeah. Thank you. I did not know that about you, that you were competitive. Mr. Wheeler, Coach Wheeler. Um, Chase, Chase stole my answer. Uh, I was basically <laughs> going to say everything that he just said, only uh, when it comes to like being in class with him and PE. And just uh, normally with PE, you're just like, have such big classes. And this year, it's just like not even half the amount of students in each class you're able to actually like, you know, get to know them so much better with the students you're actually with. Yeah, that's great. Thank you all for sharing and participating. Um, I really did want this to be a dialogue and I hope to facilitate the dialogue with my uh, videos, as I mentioned a few times. So I'm on slide five. And this term dissolve the screen has really come out since we've been in this um, COVID educational setting. Has anyone heard that term before? Or, um, no. So, you know, true hybrid learning would be what we were doing in the beginning of the year with the synchronous and asynchronous. So we're more of a hybrid setting where we have the on-campus kids and the virtual kids. But dissolving the screen is trying to make the screen disappear. So just like I would have a conversation with you in person, making sure that we're building those connections, those touch points that I mentioned, conversational with the, with the students, even though they're in the virtual setting. So it's a new educational term that's come about. And on this slide, you will see five photos, and each one of those photos is linked to either a snippet from their class or um, a resource. So the first picture is Miss Wilson, and it shows a picture of her do now. She uses a Google slideshow. Um, again, a lot of you wanted to know what other people are doing, so that's why I'm going through this. But um, she uses a Google slideshow to keep track of her daily do nows or bell ringers, whatever you want to call it. So when the students log in, it tells them what they should be doing because they meet their expectation is that they're answering that question. And then she's greeting each student. That's how she's taking attendance. She's welcoming the students. Um, she's a very structural person, so that's her style. And then you have Miss Bodier. She kind of talked about what she's doing. So that's a link to her class. And she has a daily agenda for the students. So the first thing is to do a bell ringer. The second thing, you know, what they're going to cover, what lesson, what pages in the book it's going to be on, what worksheet it is. So daily agendas are definitely helpful in the classroom. And she also uses on-course assessment for her bell ringers. So that's an easy way for her to keep track of data and um, have everything in one place. So. Um, great job, Ms. Bodier. Next, we have Dr. Knight. And um, I really encourage you, 
what he explained to you he did in his lesson i really think he was being humble but it, it is really um i would say he does that dissolve the screen um if you ever watch a good movie or a good commercial you feel like they're talking to you you know they get you they invite you in and dr knight is become a master at that apparently i guess that's just part of your personality that either you're comfortable with it or, or you're, you're used to being in the virtual world i don't know but it's pretty cool to see he stands at his door and greets his students in person and his um camera i don't know if this is strategic but is pointed at the door so you kind of feel like you're entering the classroom too and then he the bell rings and he comes directly to the camera he's in the camera welcoming you by name telling you okay this is what we're going to do blah, 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 and then he talks to the class and tells them. So it's really cool to um, just witness how he's so comfortable and that term dissolve the screen. When I think about it, I think about uh, Dr. Knight. So again, if you just click on his picture, you'll see it. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, I really wanted to show these, but my internet and Google Meet doesn't want to cooperate. So um, the next one is Miss Douglas. Miss Douglas uh, used the Nearpod. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> Miss Douglas used the Nearpod, and um, I tried to ask everybody for, for permission before I did it, but I ran out of time. So thanks. <laughs> um, it's a picture of a Nearpod. Uh, I mean, it's a clip of her Nearpod, and she um, is the only teacher that um, that I had observed throughout the week when I was recording these that had the essential question posted for the students at the beginning of the lesson and the daily objectives posted for the lesson. And then she kind of just said, this is, you know, these are the objectives for the lesson. We kind of focused on these the other day. This is the one we're focusing on now. So, you know, um, to the students, it may not seem like a big, big deal, but that consistency and setting the scene for learning, um, I think is really powerful and a good strategy to use. So kudos to you, Miss Douglas. Um, and then Miss Pilcher, I told you we have all the stars on the call. Miss Pilcher um, had a unique um, bell ringer the other day. She had the same question. She their do now was posted, but for the online kids, they answered the question in the chat, and for the kids on campus, they answered the question on a post-it note in the classroom. So they were physically writing. So that's an example of how you can have the same activity but implement it in two different ways. You could also, you know, if we were strictly virtual, you could have different ways for the students to respond as well. Um, and that kind of leads into choice boards we'll talk about later. So a few things that I had hoped that you would take away by watching these videos, and again, I encourage you to do that um, when you can. I'll try and finish a few minutes early for you to go look at those. Um, the great students by name at the door and online post a daily agenda so they know what to expect. And then post the do now or bell ringer, but make sure it's ready before the students enter the classroom or meeting so that they know what's expected. Just again, like you, um, you know, in the physical classroom, we used to have that same expectation. So continue with those um, procedures and classroom management strategies, even if you have those two different environments. The next question, uh, question two, has to do with unconditional positive regard. So how do your students know that you care about them as people? Here on slide six, I have my takeaways and suggestions, but did you guys think of anything about um, question two that you'd like to share? If you were in my classroom, I would call on you, cold call. Ms. Bodie and Ms. Belina, your hands are still up. That might be from the last question, but now you get to share. Okay, I didn't know how to undo that by hand, so <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I think that that specific feedback is, is super important. I know this happened um, the other day where I was looking at someone's assignment the night before and, you know, the cami wasn't working and I was trying to do the screencastify to give them and if that wasn't working so the next day I was able to she was in class so I was able to she asked me about that same assignment and I was able to pull pull her to the desk and you know go over what I was going to go over um, in person but I think those those little personal things where they even just calling them by name and knowing that you thought about them personally outside of the whole class I think is important for them to know that you care about them personally Great, thank you. Coach Barris? Uh, so in my health class, obviously it's like a life 
life class. So I do a lot of reflective writing after we go through whatever uh, topic we're going <laughs> through. And at first the kids were kind of like, you know, two sentences, like don't smoke, I get it, it's bad. But then they started writing paragraphs and really opening up. And I tried to do that as much as possible with whatever topic. And then while they're doing it, they can't, it's not something I give to them and then they've done and then they leave. Uh, I have, I'm like, they turn it into me, they email it to me or Google doc, I read it. And then if, you know, it's acceptable for the task, then usually that's kind of what we end with the last couple of minutes. If not, I will email them immediately back. Like, thank you so much for opening up. I tell the kids, you know, I'm not sharing this with anyone else. It's just for them to get out whatever thoughts that they have and also know that we're here for them in terms of these, these situations. And I tell them all the time, I don't know if I could do what they're doing at school right now. I, I just don't. So I, I just try to tell them I'm proud of them as much as possible. That's it. Great. Thank you. Ms. Dombrowski? It's, it's funny that you're on here twice and one of them's not frozen, but the other one is. Yeah, I'm having big yeah. computer problems here, <laughs> but yeah. uh, the, the sound seems to be working. Um, I've been trying, I'm off seventh period. I've been trying to email individual students, just like little quick notes, like about, I really like what you said in class today. Um, and even students from last year, I've been like saying, I really miss, you know, having you in homeroom, like how you doing? Um, and I've gotten like, everyone has responded back to me who I've sent an email to, and it takes like a minute. That's wonderful. Thank you for taking the time to do that. Ms. Letch? I have a question about one of the bullet points that you have typed in your slide. Okay. Um, I just like more information about it, but then use the voice feedback. What I, I think that is amazing, but I don't know how to do that. So where would I find that? Sure. Um, one suggestion that um, I've shared Coach Parrish, you're not muted. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Um, Such a great idea. I was telling Nicole about it. <laughs> is um, a lot of people were struggling with Cami or providing, you know, meaningful feedback. So using Cami, for example, at the top, they have the comment um, box. Okay. So if you, you know, if you're grading, if you're annotating with the pen or you're doing whatever, if you just use your screencastify to record what you're doing, but you speak it as you're doing it. So, okay, number five, I like how you did this, blah, blah, blah. So it's not taking any extra time. You're just recording right. what you're already doing. And then for Screencastify, it automatically has, it says copy shareable link. So yeah. if you copy the shareable link and then post it in the comment box at the top of the Cami or in the Google Doc as a comment. Yes, okay. The student can click on it and then they get that personal feedback. If it's, um, you know, something that we did write reflective, you could say, um, you know, that kind of leads into some of the questions later, but how do you kind of push that next level? You know, even if it's an online student, you can have that conversation, of, um, you know, especially for our English teachers who have such thought provoking conversations, they can um, ask them, well, I see that you had this opinion, but did you consider this? Or, you know, what do you think about this? And so extending the conversation beyond the four walls, if you will, um, of in-person. So um, that's a strategy that I would use if I were in this world to provide more individualized feedback. I love that. I'm gonna play around with it. Thank I know Ms. Kalina had done it, um, if you wanna talk to her later about it. She okay. Had, um, Mr. Shrank? So um, when I'm trying to solicit student participation uh, discussion for discussions, um, a lot of the questions that I'm asking don't really have answers. And I find that uh, students uh, often want to have the correct answer or are anxious about not having the correct answer. And so uh, I try to make an effort to, um, I don't know, kind of promote whatever they say and uh, identify with whatever they say, even if it's the opposite of what the person right before them just said, kind of 
uh, take what they've said and and run with it with them a little bit to to dem or at least I think it demonstrates that I'm interested in what they're saying and have enjoyed what they're saying uh, by playing with it with them a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Anybody else? Miss Bodia. Um, I always, especially the kids who who are brave enough to answer. Um, I'm always very thankful to them in front of the class. Thank you for participating. Your answer was great. Even if they answer incorrectly, I always give them, you know, strokes for, you know, thank you for participating. Let's look at how you're seeing it versus how we should see it as somebody who can help. Or, um, and when I grade an assignment, I never return assignment without some comment in that little chat box. You know, you did a great job. Um, I see you having some problems. Please come and see me for help. You know, I, I, I don't like to just return assignments with no comment whatsoever. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, question three had to deal with genuineness, so we're continuing with this idea. How will your students know that you care about yourself as a professional? So um, again, I give you my suggestions and feedback and things to consider, but how how would you consider that? Um, you know, is that a priority for you, or do you just not even think about it? Miss Pace. Miss Pacey, there. I can't hear. I'm not sure if y'all can hear. Okay, I'm sorry. I was on mute. Okay, here you go. Um, the word genuine is very important to me with education because I think mm -hmm. the kids can read into you on a daily basis. Um, and knowing, I had a kid ask me the other day, you know, and, I, and she caught me off guard because I was right in the middle of teaching. And she goes, Miss Pace, you look like you really love teaching. Do you really love it? And I, I, I absolutely, you know, this is something that I, that it, I put first, really. So they know and they can feel it. And then they, they become comfort with you and open up with, you know, with the learning and, and they will learn. And I, with the kids, I think since they came to class and we get to interact more, it, they're more, they're more open than on online because they wouldn't even talk, you know, I, you didn't know they had a tongue. And then, <laughs> wow. and at first, and I say this, you know, I, I, I almost invited the talking in class, you know, just because they wouldn't talk online for a long time because I don't think they, it took me a long time to learn how to talk to a screen much less them opening up to a screen. It's it's kind of, it's very different. Right. So they can feel the genuine and, and we all put off a certain vibration, you know, and they, they can pick it up very fast. I agree a hundred percent. And that's kind of the dissolving the screen too. you know, think about looking at those videos from other people and how they may do it or, or just to give you ideas as well. And then just practice, like you said, just, just doing it and you become more comfortable. I think we can all say that. I definitely wasn't comfortable with this in the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, the things that I commented on were to dress and groom professionally, project a demeanor that is optimistic about them and you. I'm showing you a very optimistic uh, demeanor right now, even though I'm really upset I couldn't show all my videos, but it's okay. We're going to get through this and, and you're going to go look at them and see them. Um, and then make it clear in words and actions that this is a place for learning about themselves, the world, and each other. A lot of you gave examples of that already, how, you know, you've been able to make connections for them or to um, call something personal from their lives to bring into the classroom. So um, thank you guys for giving examples of that. Um, question four is in the non-directivity category, how will your students know you hold their abilities in high regard? Um, you may think it's intentional and it's obviously your teacher, you're there for them. We're not in this because we don't like to help students and to see them develop, but how will your students know that you hold their abilities in higher regards? What kinds of things that can you do or say? 
and some of you mentioned this already, but uh, Ms. Pilcher. Um, I just try when I have an assignment that um, that is like a larger assignment, something we've been building up to that I really want to take the time to give them um, like really good feedback on. Um, I just make sure that, you know, I highlight a lot of glows as well as even if it's an assignment that clearly was a struggle bus. Um, making sure that I emphasize like the bright side of um, what they've done and what they're trying to do uh, is something that I do that I think shows them that I see their effort and um, and that I know that they're, you know, they've, they've tried. Yeah. Ms. Joyner. Hey, um, I try to make sure that when I do call on kids to participate with assignments, because I, I'll give them the opportunity to um, to let me know they want to participate, but then I do call, call on kids to also participate. And when I do, most kids participate actively, um, but some kids will answer, like how you mentioned earlier in the call, and they'll say, well, I don't get anything. And I tell my kids from day one, even with them learning online, that them saying, I don't get anything is not acceptable or fair, because I tell them, if you've sat there and you listen to me talk for 20 minutes a time, 20 minutes or however long I, I talked for, so there's something that you caught on to and something that you can help with. And I try to encourage them through like just the little steps. I'm like, you don't have to have everything, but you, you have to catch on to some part. So tell me what part it is that you caught on to and then we'll grow from there. And I keep reminding them that it's all growth and we do the same assignment again and we're going to keep seeing it. You have to keep on trying, but you, you are never allowed to say, I don't get anything because it's right. all that you get and it's always related to what we are learning and you and if you don't get something then i want them to form the questions of how to ask for help appropriately like i didn't get how you did that example or i didn't get how you did this specific part i try to teach them to be more specific and the question is so that we really are growing from and i tell them that their questions help me to grow too as a teacher because i present the materials as far as i know how to present it and right. how believe they're going to have any kind of issues with it. I said, when you ask me a question, it helps me to also think about it in a different light and present it in a different way. So um, I just don't allow them to, to ever say, I don't get anything. It's never acceptable in my class. And it helps them to, to, to ask questions more efficient or better, just better questions. Yep. And Ms. Belandry kind of echoed what you were just saying, acknowledge their growth, reflecting on how far they've come, even if they aren't reaching the scale just yet. And um, that goes into student growth, uh, student goal setting and students tracking their learning. Now some resources on the next couple slides that will discuss how you might implement some of that in your class. Um, so thank you for that, Mr. Landry. Ms. Pace. I didn't have my hand up, hand up, hand up. but I do have a question. Okay. So not to, not to jump off track, but just to go back real quick, to your castify because I only caught half of it. Uh -huh. uh, do you castify? I mean, record when you are great. You open the document and then castify to get that yeah. feedback. Yes. Okay. Okay. So as you would normally grade it in the cami, you're doing more annotations and writing and circling and highlighting and stuff. So it's that's a little more interactive. But the same thing on a Google Doc if you were editing the document. Um, but you're just kind of like showing them your thought process and you're not going to do this on every assignment but something that you know required their their thinking and you're really assessing it it's a great way for them to get more individualized feedback and you can target what you want to target you know if you're only focusing on one part is the main uh part of the assignment then that's the part you focus on for the feedback if that makes yeah. sense i was thinking of using that on my fluency test great i'd love to hear your feedback if you do try it I'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great. Um, the next slide, I'm on slide nine, says to provide opportunities for student self-assessment and reflection. And this is what I was just talking about. Um, we all know Miss Amy, know and love her. I've been teaching with her for over 10 years. And so I knew her as just a classroom teacher. Um, and she was just as amazing then. But um, she does a great job. She's actually teaching biology too right now. So she shared an idea with me uh, to share with you guys of 
most people are familiar with the KWL charts, the, what you know, what you want to know, what you learned. Those have been around for a while to kind of help track their learning throughout the, um, their understanding throughout the learning process. And so um, for more of the hands-on classes or the push towards modeling, she has a resource there that kind of walks students through that what you know, what you want to know, what you learn, but in terms of modeling. So if you click on her picture, it'll bring you to that link. If you click on my picture, it'll bring you to a link from a learning tracker that I had used when I taught biomed. And it kind of has an, a checklist for our younger division teachers. They call it the IPN statements. It may seem juvenile and, and not appropriate for older kids, but I promise you they still need to have a focus and still have that reflective piece of how they feel before the lesson about a topic or how they, what they're supposed to get at the end of the lesson. Did they get it? Did they not? So um, using those learning trackers or, and that particular one that I linked also, it would be kind of a whole lesson thing. So it had that part at the top and then it was kind of guided notes as they went through it and also had vocabulary and things. So it was kind of a guided note taking um, strategy that I had used um, through Project Lead the Way training. I had, uh, you know, learned a lot of those techniques. So share that with you guys. And then the last picture is Miss Lauren Smith. And she um, does a lot of reflection with her kids. So she shared a doc with us to look at some of the ways that she uses reflection in her classroom to get feedback from the students, not specifically on content always. Sometimes it's about content, but just checking in with them and another one of those touch points to build the relationships with the students. So if you click on her picture, I'll bring you to her doc that she shared with us. Um, so again, highlighting that the students track and assess their understanding throughout the learning process. However you get that to go, um, please share resources with everybody, with me, and I can share it with everybody. Um, and then students providing feedback to the teacher and the teacher responding to the student feedback. If they're giving you something or telling you something and you don't do anything with it or acknowledge it, then they're probably not going to do it again. So making sure that we, um, we do that. Does anybody have anything to add for that? Do you do any type of um, student goal setting? I know this is on our um, evaluation rubric, and it's kind of the thing that a lot of people ask for more information or more, you know, more support with. So I wanted to share some of those strategies with you guys. No. Okay. Um, the next slide, slide 10, um, more about student feedback and checking for understanding. And we shout out, we have here highlighted our math department because all three of them um, on slide 10, Ms. Joyner, Mr. Stahl, and Ms. Belina, two of them are on our call, um, did a great job of using our educational technology platforms to provide immediate student feedback and checking for understanding in real time. So they didn't waste time. Um, you know, with the teaching the whole lesson and then waiting to the next day or waiting to a quiz to find out if the students got it. So in this hybrid world, the students are on their Nearpod and it's really cool to see how, how individualized and how quick both Ms. Joyner and Ms. Belina were like, check the x-axis, check the slope, check this. Or it just, I, I mean, I don't know if you guys want to add to it. If you click on their picture, you'll see a link from their class, but it might be interesting to hear from you guys how that's helped you in this setting. Um, I'll share. I think I think this that's been one of the silver linings about this pandemic for me is it's, it's been an, a super easy way for me to, like you said, give immediate feedback and not just wait. Because even in the classroom when you're walking around trying to give feedback as they're working, you can't see everybody at once and it's hard to look over somebody's shoulder. But when you have their work directly, you have while people's work directly in front of you and as they're working it, so you can give them immediate feedback so they can change it right away because most of the time I don't think my students really read my comments or really get what I want to after I spend hours grading and commenting and making screencastifies and all this to give them feedback. Um, but if you tell them immediately and watch them erase it and change it in real time, then you know you've made an impact. Yeah, and if you watch those videos, you will see it. They are immediately erasing and fixing it, and that that's just really cool to see. So good job. Ms. Joyner, did you have anything to add? 
I'm so sorry, my son was talking to me, so forgive me. Um, uh, what was the question? Oh, no, I was just highlighting you. Your video clip is in the Google slideshow about how using Nearpod to give immediate feedback in the kids. You're like, you were saying check your slope or okay. how check your y-axis or whatever but you can um miss blind was saying you can immediately see the students erasing and fixing their answers so that was really cool to see and then mr stall um he's a veteran teacher he, he and he's a coach so you can hear his demeanor and his in the class and he does a great job of one of the strategies is to call the student's name before you um ask the question we want to encourage cold calling like you know you can pull popsicle sticks or pick a random number from your roster things like that but you really want to monitor who, if you've called on every kid in the class we don't want kids to be invisible or hide and um miss pilcher is on the call but miss smith also does a form of this she's starting a daily participation grade and i want to be sure that i don't mean daily participation in that they you know, they complete something. We don't give completion grades, but a daily participation grade where a student is asking a thought provoking question or an extension question, you know, we want students to make those connections. So Ms. Pilcher, do you want to talk about how you've been doing that? Yeah, um, so basically I was looking for kind of more ways that I could interact, I guess, with students and kind of compel them to uh, participate. And obviously like based on our school policy, I wanted something to be, well, school policy and my own personal class policy. It needed to be really sure. meaningful. Um, and so I just decided that every time I asked a question that I felt was meaningful that I would put on an assignment and assess as an assignment grade, there was no reason that it couldn't be something that we do together in class. It doesn't have to necessarily be something that's turned in. And so um, I can post a question and just have them respond like in real time to me and each other um, through our Google Meets and in the classroom all at once. And I can still give them a grade for that. Um, if they don't necessarily have to get the question 100% spot on, um, most of the time the questions are kind of open-ended so that there's no like real right or wrong definitive answer but it's more showing me that you were engaged in the class and have something meaningful to contribute and then i make it worth one percent of their grade so if they miss uh if they decide not to participate for one of these questions that i ask or on um, any given day um it's not going to really over affect their grade overall but missing deciding not to participate again and again it can impact their grade um and then i find honestly that almost everyone participates and then yeah, you like 100 percent participation since that yeah I, I basically have had 100 percent participation um i give them opportunities so i don't just post one single question but i usually post a couple of questions i give them some think time and then they have to participate in some way during that class and then i also modify it a little bit for students who um maybe are uncomfortable in front of the big, the larger group where if they respond to that question in writing to me by email within the class period, um, I can count that as well as like demonstration of knowledge. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And um, please reach out to her for more um, information about how she tracks that and uses that feedback. But that's a great example of an authentic assessment. She is assessing what the students know because she's planning, and this is the part of the lesson design, planning those opportunities for learning checks and providing that opportunity to hear from the students. And now the students, you know, they're getting that extrinsic motivation with the participation points, but now they're just doing it more regularly and almost 100% participation is pretty amazing. So kudos to you for trying that and please reach out to her for more information um, on that. Thanks, um, yeah, definitely. And so the last question I have is how will you encourage encourage critical thinking and i think this is where every teacher wants to get we want every student to go deep into our discussions into our content and you know remember for the rest of their lives our lessons because that's why we're teachers is to help inform them and develop them so some of my suggestions are here as well um i have a few examples slide 12 says student voice and choice um the first picture is miss richmond she does she calls it a transcript 
of the class. So a lot of the students were having trouble with technology, with absences, with you know in and out because of the technology or just couldn't get on. So she, um, the students kind of helped develop this transcript from the class and then she posts it as a resource, kind of like a teacher's daily notes type of thing. Um, but that's really cool that the teachers voiced that and she listened to it. Student voice could also be in the form of the product or the process in an assignment. You know, they can choose what the product looks like or how they get to that. Do they want to do a different mode of learning, a poster versus a paper or things like that? Um, Mr. Landry is a fairly new teacher and he's also new to our school. And I did a um, session during new teacher on choice boards and he took it and ran with it and has really implemented that in the biology class. So if you click on his picture, it'll bring you to a Google slide that has his choice board on it. So he has a math connection, a writing connection, and history connection. Um, he decided one of those everybody was going to do, and there's a second one that the students could choose from to do. And so providing the student choice um, in, in that process, or in the product, excuse me, is um, more engaging for the students. So I love choice boards. I always did a choice assignment when I was teaching. I think one caveat is that he's doing it too much because he's putting too much pressure on himself to keep up with all that. But I would suggest at least one per unit or one per, per topic so that you can, um, you know, you can keep up with it and it's doable to be able to grade all that. But he's spends a lot of time doing all that. So kudos to you, Mr. Landry. Do you want to add anything? Sometimes there's an art one too. Yeah, so I mean, definitely it helps the kids that are more interested in, um, and the four, usually there's for art history, um, writing or math, and um, it helps strengthen those skills too. So autographing, or um, I actually try to get them to calculate um, molarity, which may be a little bit um, more advanced, but that will help Mr. Lopez when he has him for chemistry or whoever is teaching chemistry, if it's me, whatever. But um, it helps think in those things too. And also does give them a choice so they kind of feel like it's not just homework, it's actually interesting. And it also ties in with whatever um, section I'm in. So we've got homeostasis, then those things have to do with, you know, old scientists that discovered things, if it's history or discovered insulin, if we're talking about blood sugar levels. So um, they get a kick out of some of them. They hate Flipgrids, um, but I love them so much. So um, some of the time, most of the time it has some kind of Flipgrid or modeling or something for the art connections too. So it's fun for me. So I think they like it too, but we'll see. Awesome. So um, click on that to check out those resources. I do have an eye on the time, so um, I will be finishing up in a minute. Um, the next slide, slide 13, is about student collaboration using Jamboard and Jigsaws. The first two pictures, Ms. Lyons and Ms. Giarelli, those are examples of how they use Jamboard in their class. Ms. Lyons used it more in kind of a modified Socratic seminar. She's reading the Hunger Games and novels, so she had three different slides in her Jamboard where students had to put a post in. So, you know, they can't do it face to face because of the setting, but they're still collaborating. She's still getting that individualized kind of learning check, like Ms. Pilcher was mentioning, but just in a different format. So that's really cool. It's just her slides with the sticky note, sticky note, the virtual sticky note Jamboard, but each kid was required to do that. And so that facilitated this, the discussion for the day about what they had read. And then Ms. Giarelli uses Jamboard more for note taking. So it's a collaborative process where the students are able to um, kind of like close notes. The students are able to fill it in and she's able to highlight um, some of their responses and things. So both of those are examples of Jamboard. The third picture is Miss Anna Butler. She teaches civics and there was a, um, this is a literacy connection. They were reading an article. It was pretty in depth. So she didn't want all the kids to read the whole thing. So she jigsawed it and she gave each group, she used breakout rooms. She gave each group two sections from the paper to read. And she did virtual breakout rooms using Google Meets. And then she had, I think six kids in her class. So she just treated them as two more groups of three. So when they did the discussion, it was every single person, whether they were in person or online, were part of this discussion and it, it just built that collaborative piece. I only have her instructions, I don't have her discussion, but it was amazing. So check out how she logistically told the students how to do that, that's her picture. Um, does anybody have any other suggestions about collaboration, either with these platforms or other ones that they've used?
No. Okay. Um, our last highlight is the term make it work. And this is Coach Barris. This is Coach Barris's class. As he mentioned, he teaches um, EMR and he has the distinct pleasure to get them all certified in CPR, whether they're in person or at home. So he made it work. He made his kids at home grab a pillow and do CPR on a pillow. So it was really cool. They were all doing the same thing, but some were using a pillow, some were using the mannequins at school, and the next day it was flip flop. So it's just a great video to hear him encouraging the kids and the kids participating, doing CPR on a pillow. It was fantastic. So good job for making it work, Coach Ferris. And the very last slide, one minute over, are two recommended books that I've enjoyed reading recently. One of them is the Distance Learning Playbook, and the other is Teaching in the Post-COVID Classroom. They're both linked to Amazon, and they are both available on Audible, um, just for anybody who wants to read more about these types of student engagement, um, virtual, hybrid uh, learning situations. Um, but thank you so much, guys, for staying on with me and participating. You guys are great. Please go back and look at those videos. It's, it was um, it was an honor to be in all of your classrooms. And middle school people, feel free to share some with me so I can add to this. And I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was really good. I can't. This I got so many great ideas. I can't wait to. Um, I got this. I really appreciate this. This was amazing. Thank you. Thank you.